Okay, guys, I want to go over with you just taking a look at a map of the world and focusing in on different regions of the world and different conflicts and problems that tend to come up uh, that you see on the AP exam and just topics that you should really know just to be uh, to just to be a master in the material for this class. So let's start in North America and we'll start with Canada. Quebec, the uh, conflict with uh, Quebec in Canada has come up several times on the AP exam. Uh, and of course, if we're looking, if we're going to zoom in on the area here, first of all, if you just look at some of the toponyms or place names of the area, you could see that there's a French influence here. Okay. Uh, the air, this area here, <clears throat> Quebec, has a dominant French majority. Of course, the language that they speak is French. Their ethnicity is French. And even though Canada is what we would consider a federal state, uh, they still have had some pretty major conflicts with regards to their ethnic breakdown, especially with regards to the Quebecois. Uh, that has caused uh, some issues of uh, not devolution, but definitely pushing out more powers to Quebec to try and prevent uh, Quebec from uh, gaining, uh, or I guess, voting for independence. And it's come close several times uh, when they've had these votes. It's come very close, but they haven't uh, quite managed to get their independence. And of course, now with the coronavirus, I think a lot of these independence movements that you're going to, that you've, we've discussed before over the course of the year, those are all going to be put on hold because you have much, much bigger issues at play now rather than just um, ethnic conflicts. So um, that would be Canada for sure. You could discuss that with regards to Canada. The United States, um, I think the United States, when you're looking at the U.S., it's going to be more along the lines of maybe border conflicts, migration issues with that. Uh, oftentimes in um when you're looking at the United States, uh, when it shows up on the AP exams, it's going to be things like culture. So religion, uh, perhaps language, um, migration patterns. That's always a good one. Gerrymandering. Don't forget about gerrymandering. That's an important one also. Let's zoom over to Europe. Uh, and we'll start first with the United Kingdom. So you have several different conflicts when you're looking at the United Kingdom. Uh, the first would be the uh, conflict between... Um, the UK and, or I, I guess you, should, you could say the southern portions of the UK and Scotland, okay, those independence movements. Once again, devolutionary pressures there for sure. And of course, the United Kingdom is a unitary state. So those devolutionary pressures are going to be even higher because you don't have the structure of a federal system like what you did in Canada or, or what you do in Canada or the, or the United States. And so when you don't have a federal system, unitary systems really, really are, are experiencing tremendous pressure to um, push powers to more regional governments to prevent uh, devolution and or balkanization from occurring. Also, don't forget the about the conflict with Northern Ireland. That's something that's, that's uh, I'm sorry, Northern Ireland and Ireland. That's something that has settled down over the years, but still is important to the people of that particular region. And of course, that's a religious conflict, uh, the, the difference between uh, Protestantism and Catholicism, which of course goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and, um, but that, but for the most part, the conflict when you're discussing, you know, political unit in this class is going to be with Scotland. Hopping over to some place like Belgium, you can discuss the, uh, Wallonia and, uh, Flanders. Okay. So Wallonia, that's going to be in the Southern portion of Belgium, and that's going to be primarily French speaking. And then of course, the Northern portion of Belgium, that's going to be Flanders or the Flemish area. And of course they're Dutch. And that is a conflict that goes back actually for quite a, quite a, several hundred years. Uh, and those are conflicts that you discuss, you can discuss um, ethnic conflict and of course, language conflict there. Moving further south, if we go to Spain, uh, don't forget about Catalonia. Okay, that's another really good example of those devolutionary pressures that we talk about often, uh, especially in the political unit. And of course, that's culture. Oh, one other thing, when we're looking at Europe in particular, I mean, there are certain things we need to discuss with Europe. First of all, the EU, the influence of the EU, the influence of World War II and post-World War II on Europe. Don't forget that Germany was split. Okay. And of course, Berlin was split. And remember, you had East and West Germany. And the Eastern portion of Germany was under the influence of the former Soviet Union. The Western portion of Germany was um, tilted more towards, of course, the West. Uh, and once the wall, the Berlin Wall fell, <clears throat> And the collapse of communism happened in the late uh, 1980s, early 1990s. Of course, the entire political map began to change. 
and countries uh, like the former Yugoslavia. And this is, of course, is the Balkan Peninsula where we get the term Balkanization from. The former Balkan, uh, the former Yugoslavia devolved into many, many different um, countries after quite a bloody war that happened uh, in the, during this time. Uh, and of course, Yugoslavia should be, you should have tons of information underneath uh, your belt for uh, the former Yugoslavia. Uh, but also when we're looking at Europe, don't forget that in each one of these countries, and actually this is kind of an interesting pattern you tend to see a lot, this north-south divide. You see it in the United States, of course, we, you know, we tend to think back to the Civil War, but even to this day, you see this north-south divide, especially, you know, in, in the, the north. Gosh, if you were to, to just hop onto any social media account, you would see, um, you know, complaints about the south and how the south is considered dumb or the south is considered less educated. And uh, not only that, not only do you see that in the United States, but you also see that in other countries throughout Europe as well. There's a definite disconnect or divide between northern Italy and southern Italy and um, kind of northern France and southern France. And even in countries like Belgium, you see that split between northern and southern. So it's not something that you just see in the United States. It is kind of a, I have to really think about this being a global phenomenon, but you do tend to see this pattern a lot of this north-south split within individual countries. Okay, so one other thing, uh, one other thing to think about when you're looking at um, uh, Europe is th this thought of the, the stability of the EU. Is the EU going to be stable enough to kind of last into the future? And with all the migration issues that have been happening and funding issues that have been happening, and then of course now with coronavirus and the shutdown of the shutting down of of that those common borders in Europe, um, you know, the Schengen Agreement has basically just been suspended and borders have been shut down. It, it kind of brings to mind, you know, things may look very different in the future with um, when we're looking at Europe. Uh, let's not forget about, of course, Russia. Russia is the largest country on the planet. And of course, it's really amazing to see the size and the scope of the country when you have it on a map like this. Uh, and remember, Russia is basically two separate countries that are split by the Ural Mountains, the western portion of Russia tilts towards the west, right? The east, eastern portion of Russia tends to tilt towards the east. And if I had, a, I wish I had a population density map up, but you could see the majority of population of Russia is in the western portions of Russia. Um, and the Russian uh, Federation, you know, after the collapse of the former Soviet Union, you had this devolution in Russia occur, or in the former Soviet Union occur, to independent states that were created. So that's a post-Cold War, um, I guess, set up as well. Okay, let's move further south. Uh, let's discuss the area here, okay, with regards to Turkey. One thing to think about with Turkey is Turkey is kind of, uh, you know, is, is stretched between two separate continents, okay, because don't forget Turkey is also in Europe. Um, but when we're looking at uh, this area here, so it's kind of the beginning of the Middle East or um, Southwest Asia, uh, this region here is known to be, uh, this is where the Kurds are located. And of course, they desperately want an independent Kurdistan. The Kurds are the largest stateless nation on the planet. So you definitely need to know that. Uh, moving further south into the Middle East, uh, you'd be remiss if you didn't know about the conflict in Israel between the, is the Israelis and uh, the people that live here, which they call themselves the Palestinians. Um, also, just kind of look at the dotted lines on this map that tells you that this territory is under conflict, okay, and it's disputed territory. Syria, of course, is in the middle of a civil war right now. Um, we know that Iran and Saudi Arabia don't get along with each other at all. And so um, that's something to consider as well. And of course, this is a religious conflict, right? Even though we know that both of these countries are dominant, um, it, you know, Islamic countries, that there are different forms of Islam. So just kind of like when we were looking at different forms of Christianity back here, uh, created conflict, we're seeing the same thing happen in this particular part of the world as well. Also, let's not forget about Arab Spring. Uh, and Arab St Spring, we know we can connect that to a Tunisian street vendor. Um, that was the beginning of Arab Spring, but just this, this thought of trying to get more independence. Uh, as we know, uh, this entire region was ruled by basically a series of, you know, strong arm men or, or dictators. And um, after the fall of Saddam Hussein in Iraq, 
the other countries in the region, they began the, the citizens of other countries in the re region began to realize that, hey, you know, we didn't we don't necessarily have to live uh, under a dictator. And so you began to see uh, this really dramatic shift. And the shift was uh, brought in part by uh, modern social media. And that's actually something you think about is the role of technology in political systems and how technology changes so much in how people congregate and protest and all of those things. Okay. Even in countries that have their social media locked down pretty tightly places like uh, China and Iran for that matter. Okay. So moving further East, let's talk about India. <clears throat> of course, India, a uh, legacy of colonialism and many countries in here are legacies of um, British colonialism. And remember the expression, the sun never set on the British empire. And that's due to colonialism all across the planet. And of course you could see the diffusion of English due to that as well. But zooming into India, remember that the northern portion of India, especially the Kashmir region, and once again, look at that dotted line. Those dotted lines mean that this is under dispute. Okay, we're not quite sure what this border looks like, so it's under dispute. And uh, remember, you've got this conflict that comes um, from the partitioning of India in 1947, when you had millions of people kind of going back and forth. The British left and they're like, okay, this section here will be for Muslims and this section here will be for um, Hindus. That was kind of the thought. Uh, didn't necessarily work out that way, but to a certain extent it did. And you did have mass migration. You had many people that were killed in conflicts during this time. And of course, back then you also had the whole East Pakistan thing before the modern nation of Bangladesh. Uh, so you have language conflict there, um, you know, ethnic conflict, religious conflict, also kind of tied up in, into political systems. Sri Lanka, you have independence movements with the Tamils in Sri Lanka, moving uh, further east towards Myanmar and uh, the Rohingya in Myanmar. And the thought is, is that this is an area that is experiencing some ethnic cleansing, um, with uh, so this is kind of a Buddhist Muslim conflict here. So it's a re religious conflict that you tend to see there. Moving further um, east again to places like Vietnam. Now Vietnam, of course, in the Vietnam War, that's something that happened back um, in the '60s, in the mid '60s, and uh, kind of uh, towards the uh, early part of the 1970s. And that was a legacy of the Cold War. Okay, as was uh, there we go as was the Korean conflict. So let's not forget about that. And of course, Korean conflict, it's a um, great example of a superimposed boundary, right? You have the boundary that was uh, put in place here at the end of the Korean conflict. And it really wasn't even an end of the war because the war didn't really officially end. Uh, so you have um, a dictatorship in North Korea and you have a free uh, South Korea Okay. And of course, let's take a look at uh, China. Sorry, in China, <clears throat> uh, you have many different conflicts going on in China. The first, of course, we can't forget about the fact that China is a communist country. And so some of the relationships with people in the area can be a little tumultuous. Hong Kong in particular, I think, is one of these areas that it was a former British protectorate. It was turned over to China not too long ago with the promise that Hong Kong would be able to stay, you know, free and independent. And that's beginning to change now. And that's creating quite a bit of conflict in that region. Taiwan, we can't forget about Taiwan because uh, Taiwan and China are thought to be, well, <laughs> this is the conflict. <clears throat> They're separate countries, but no one likes to think of them as separate countries because they don't want to make China angry. Uh, and so that's creating all kinds of conflict every now and again. And with the coronavirus, this is beginning to pop up as well. You're beginning to see lots and lots of nationalism on the, um, in the country of China with the thought that, yeah, we need to take over Taiwan. We're, we're done playing with Taiwan. It needs to be us. It needs to be us taking over Taiwan. And of course, if that were to happen, I'm pretty sure that a war would break out. You just couldn't have China invading Taiwan without the global community responding. It, it, and let's just hope that, that that's not the case. Uh, the Uyghurs, we can't forget about the Uyghurs. Uh, they're an ethnic slash religious group in the Western portions of China. And uh, I'm sure you've seen news articles about this. I know I've talked about it in class, that the Uyghurs are a group that um, has been experiencing, uh, some on some accounts, ethnic cleansing, definitely internment camps, forced labor camps. Uh, and so um, that's kind of part of the issue that's going on with China right now. 
moving further south to the South China Sea and the Nine Dash Line. That's the conflict that we have over the Spratly Islands, okay, and the Paracel Islands, basically everything in the South China Sea where China is flexing uh, and they are taking over some of these islands. Let's see if we can kind of zoom in with the satellite here if it'll let me do it. Um, they are taking some of these atolls and they're basically building military bases out of them. And it's a violation of the United Nations law of the sea statutes. Uh, and they've gone to, you know, they've been taken to court by the, um, the Philippines over this and the end result is nothing. It's just kind of a slap on the hand. China continues to do what they want to do. And so uh, the, you know, the countries in the surrounding region, Vietnam and the Philippines and whatever, they're not happy at all about it because they want to make sure that they have free and fair trade. Um, that's it. basically passage of the seas. That's an, it's an important concept. And the United Nations has, has said this as well, but uh, the only ones that are really able to kind of come up against this or, or I guess push back against China would be the United States because we're the only ones that have a strong enough Navy to be able to do that. And so the people in this region really, really want the U.S. to be involved. Okay, moving, let's go back over to Africa. Okay, so in, um, let me look and see. Let's start with Nigeria. Nigeria is a country that's split among several different, actually many different ethnic groups, many different language groups. Actually, let me back up. Let me do this instead. So uh, when we look at the, the modern um, continent of Africa, we have to think about the Conference of Berlin. And of course, that was that meeting that I discussed before with European colonizing powers that said, hey, let's not fight over Africa. Let's just go ahead and, um, you know, divvy it up. Let's split it up. And when they did that, they didn't really pay attention to the cultural boundaries, the linguistic boundaries of the region, because there were so many. And quite frankly, they didn't really care about that at the time because people didn't think that way at that time. And so the end result was drawing boundaries and borders that just don't make sense for the region. And so what do you have? Well, you have countries like Nigeria with multiple, multiple hundreds of languages, different religions, different ethnicities, then that creates lots of conflicts there. You can also talk about a core periphery relationship in Nigeria. That would work as well. Uh, and just like always, the urban areas tend to be wealthier. The rural areas tend to be poor. Okay. Uh, moving more over to the east, so let's talk about Sudan. South Sudan is our most recent country, and this is a conflict between Muslims in the north and Christians in the south, which is why the border was created here. And if we were to even zoom in here, you could see that this is there's some disputed territory. Okay, that's already beginning to occur. Uh, already beginning to occur, even though the country is relatively new. We're having some border skirmishes and, and conflicts now. Uh, let's see. Oh gosh, Rwanda. We can't forget about Rwanda and the conflict that happened there. Basically the genocide that happened there. Uh, this was the conflict between the Hutus and the Tutsis. And once again, this is a remnant of European colonialism, uh, that, that, and, and you know, the thing is, is the, these conflicts were in place before the Europeans ever got there. But, um, uh, the European presence there just made it so much worse. Okay. So once the Europeans left, uh, like always, remember when we talked about decolonization that happened, there were two waves. The first wave happened here um, after United States independence. And then the second wave happened here, <laughs> basically the rest of the planet post-World War II, because the colonizers in uh, in Europe, they couldn't afford to deal with those colonies anymore. So they pretty much just said, okay, I'm out. And uh, when they said that, that created the, the conflicts that were there just kind of bubbled over. Okay. And we saw that um, one of the examples I always give you is when we're looking at the former Yugoslavia. So uh, let's see, moving further south, another legacy of colonialism would be South Africa. Okay. Where you have um, Afrikaners and actually several different ethnic groups located in South Africa. And of course, one of the things that we associate with South Africa is this concept of apartheid, which isn't around anymore, but it was something that loomed large for quite a while. Um, one other thing about South Africa, it's, it's environmental, uh, Cape down for the longest time. And if I were to pull this over, let's see. Yeah. You can see how, uh, just the physical geography of the region is dry, right? You've got some deserts here, then I mean desert. But um, one of the things with South Africa to think about is the water resource issues that they've had there. And of course, when we're looking at political, we don't tend to think about environmental aspects being political problems. But if we were to look over 
back uh, with India and Pakistan, one of the problems and one of the main conflicts when we're talking about Kashmir is the fact that you have the, the, the main water sources of India and Pakistan, these main rivers of, um, of the Ganges and the Indus rivers, they're, they're beginnings start way in the mountains up here. And so if you control up here, you also control basically the flow of the rivers there. Okay. So that's something to think about the environmental consequences. And I always tell my students, environmental law, great, great uh, field to get into. And it's only going to continue um, as the planet continues to grow and as countries continue to grow. Okay. Moving over to Latin America, I kind of make it a big circle around the planet. Uh, when we look at Brazil, Brasilia is our example of a forward capital. And of course, countries create forward capitals to try and push development out to the rest of the country um, and, you know, to bring wealth to the rest of the country. And we see that in several different places. OK, so another example of a forward capital. Actually, Pakistan's had several. Islamabad, and look at the toponym for um, Pakistan, but Islamabad um, moved further north, one, to help you know be closer to those natural resources, but two, to try and stake a claim over the Kashmir area. So that's something else to think about. And uh, one more thing, because we don't tend to see, honestly, when you're looking at those former FRQs, there's not a lot when we're looking at um, Latin America. So that's something to, to think about, uh, just kind of thinking, for, you know, forward thinking about predicting future FRQs is Latin America hasn't shown up very much. So I would make sure that you know a little bit about Latin America. So, uh, you know, of course, Venezuela is undergoing um, tremendous, uh, just tremendously difficult problems right now because of the the dictator, um, I guess, strong arm that you have uh, happening in Venezuela. Also, Chile and Argentina have had many, many different border disputes that's something to think about. Um, Bolivia has had some border disputes as well with, with Chile. And of course, they're landlocked because of it. So, and Peru, they're landlocked because of it. So that's something to think about. You know, what are the impacts of being a landlocked co uh, country? Um, I'm trying to think what else. And of course, Cuba, communist country, their relationship with the United States. Um, a lot of the stuff in that we tend to think about when we're looking at the, the, uh, political aspect of Latin America would be um, the impact of communism in this region, especially during the 1980s. And that, of course, was connected to drug trade and all kinds of other things. But um, just the instability in the region because of low development and the United States getting involved. Because, you know, we don't necessarily want, I mean, we're really, really close to here, guys. It's, you know, it's I don't know, maybe 800 miles. And you don't want an area so close to you being destabilized because that eventually leads to, and, and as we've seen in the past, just massive migration in to the United States uh, of people trying to flee, you know, narco terrorism and all kinds of other things here. So lots to think about when we're looking at uh, the planet. So I hope this helped to review different regions. This is obviously not all encompassing. There's so much more. We could talk about the Arctic for that matter. Oh, this is not a, I can't get a polar projection here, but um, something to think about with regards to law of the sea is the fact that a lot of this now is beginning to slowly melt, which means that ships can pass through here much easier. And that will definitely impact law of the sea and how we tend to view um, this particular part of the world with regards to natural resources. So, all right.